Warning, the following program contains graphic and explicit examples of syntax, language, nouns and verbs. Viewer discretion is advised. While there is no age restriction, parental guidance is recommended for all parents watching. You must therefore ensure that you are being guided by a responsible grade 12 or younger student. A very good afternoon to you all out there. Our topic for this afternoon is a review of the English first additional language grade 12 common test that was written in March. Today we are looking at the test and of course at the memorandum but more than that we are also going to include certain little lessons that can be learned from this test since it is very much a condensed form of paper one and of course paper one you will be writing in June and in September and finally the big one in November so this is excellent training for certain aspects of that. Before we go on, I'd like to put a phone number here. If there are any questions that you would like to ask, you can WhatsApp to this number. As you can see, it is 76 And the questions will be addressed during this broadcast, as long as it's still the live one today, which is, of course, Friday, the 17th of April. Now, today, you'll see here, I'll put this under the camera just to let you know what's actually happening. And there you see my copy of the grade 12, March 2015, English First Additional Language. Time one hour marks 40 common paper. And that is a very complex mouthful that you have just heard. I like this paper. I don't know who compiled it, so I have no ulterior motive to saying this. But I regarded this paper as somebody's masterpiece. It's really, really professionally compiled. It was easy to print, which makes a big difference, but we'll go into that another time. The one thing, though, that we must mention about this, it is not easy. I'll repeat that. This paper was certainly not easy. But having said that, um, you'll see that it's a great way of preparing you for those paper ones that come at a later date. Now, in order to derive full benefit from this broadcast, I would recommend that all of you watching have a copy of this paper with you and obviously you're going to need your script if you have it and a pen or a pencil or some other means with which to write otherwise you won't receive the full benefit from this now just an interesting tip that i've noted for the teachers it is my policy my standard policy um, to copy and hand out the memorandum of any test that has been written. This is to provide instantaneous feedback to my students. Oh, by the way, I do not have any learners in my class. I only have students. Students study. Studying is an active process. Learners learn. That tends to be a bit of a passive process. And just by way of example, here is, in fact, the reduced a copy of the memorandum that I made and handed out to my guys. There you'll see it fitted neatly on a back-to-back -back piece of paper reduced from A3 to A4. Now, that's just for interest. Good. What else do I have here? I want to mention that our school does not have a direct IBP link. And we have, in fact, been given all the IBP presentations. Of course, I'm at a secondary school, so we've only taken the secondary school uh, ones. And we are watching them in recorded form and finding them very useful. I strongly recommend that all of you watching today who do not have 
a big live IBP screen, please get hold of the recordings. They are fantastically useful. I'm sure you'll agree with me once you have seen all of them. I'm Timothy. I'm from Tapalong. It's a small school very far away from here in a town called Van Stadens Riss, of which you have probably never heard. It doesn't matter. I'm a grammar Nazi, and I bear that title proudly. And as part of being a grammar Nazi, I am conducting a war on text speak. Cell phones are very useful things. Here, let me slip this wonderful gadget under the camera and you'll see. It's an old Nokia, not the latest gadget by any means. Now, these are very useful things, but they have introduced, I don't know how many language errors into the everyday speech and writing of the younger generation. And one of my jobs, one of my main purposes in life is to eliminate the dangers of text speak. I want correct capitalization. I want correct punctuation. The grammar must be correct. That is important because otherwise you are going to lose meaning. One of the items that you'll see is coming up later. I'm going to refer to punctuation. And punctuation is there in order to clarify meaning. A comma is a simple thing. It tells you, though, when to pause. And if you don't lose that, you can completely change the meaning of a sentence. But more on that later. Now, today, I'll be referring to various books. One of the most important ones is this here. I don't know how many of the schools have got these. I assume it's everybody. It is useful. The section in this book on visual literacy is really comprehensive. It really goes into detail about body language and facial expressions and all that sort of thing. And probably uh, during the course of this broadcast, we'll look at various pages from this book. Then another book that I always recommend is, of course, this somewhat tatty by now uh, book here. This is by, of course, Lutron and Pincus. It is the English Handbook and Study Guide. If you don't yet have a copy of this, get one. And here I'm talking not only to you students who are listening there. I also want to draw this to the attention of all the teachers. It is so useful. This has guided my teaching since I first received a copy many, many years ago. I've referred to this constantly. Once you have a copy, you will do the same. And that is a guarantee. Now... A reminder, English is not an easy language. It's complex. It has very confused spelling. It has similar sounding words. Now, that does not mean that English is impossible to learn. It merely means that it requires a great deal of effort, as is required when you are learning any new language. All of you watching can speak English. I am convinced of that. But how many of you can pay attention to the very fine points of English grammar and spelling and punctuation, etc. These are important, particularly when you are dealing with paper one. Now, let us start by showing a quick reminder. I've called this tips on how to answer comprehension tests effectively. And this is just as applicable to this. Let me just arrange this over here. There we go. Good. It's just as applicable to this English common test. When we tackled the preparation for this test in March this year, I showed these notes. And I'm showing them again just as a reminder for those who never saw the previous broadcast that I presented Let's take a look so that when we review the comprehension, we can refer to these tips. Now, the first instruction is read the instructions just in case. Take nothing for granted. Very important. Sometimes 
The instructions are exactly the same as for previous tests. But on other occasions, they are not. And if you don't read the instructions, and I know very well that many of you do not read instructions, because it's evident in the way that you answer your papers. And this applies to my school as well as to the others. Just for interest's sake then, we are going to start by looking at the instructions that are in this paper. Here we are. And what does it say here? This question paper consists of two sections. Now, there's some parts that are not particularly important, so we'll skip past them. But there are other parts that are vital. So, the two sections. Section A, comprehension, 20 marks. Section B, language, 20 marks. Answer all the questions. Start each section on a new page. Please take note of that. That is so that you can make life easier for the poor person that has to mark this. Now, number four, leave a line between answers. Once again, that is critical so that the paper becomes easier to mark. Rule off after each section that indicates where you have ended a section. Number the answers correctly. That's fairly obvious. Pay special attention to spelling and sentence construction. And then number eight. Unfortunately, if you have reached grade 12 and you have an appalling handwriting, as I do, write neatly and legibly is very difficult to apply. But for your own sake, please do your best to make sure that your writing is neat and legible. Just while we're on that topic, I'd like to show you some of the pens which I carry. There they are. Do you know what all these pens have in common? They are all medium point pens. I never recommend that you write with a fine point pen. Very often, the teacher is marking at home, at night, in conditions of reduced visibility, and a fine point pen is sometimes too faint to be seen clearly. I give that to you as a tip. Right, let's go back to our comprehension tips. Now, the second tip that I give you is to read through the text at least twice to make sure you understand it fully. This will save you time. Now, this test is the only exception to that. Because the text, uh, the first of the comprehension texts, was exceptionally long, um, you may not be able to apply it in this case. Uh, let me just move those over there. Excuse me a second. Good. Now the third one. Do not read only the questions before attempting to spot the answers by identifying keywords in the text. Some of you do that. And I know it's sad but true that some of you struggle so much with English that you are really lost using other, any other method. And, well, all I can say, do your best. Number four, read the questions carefully, taking note of the instructions. And there, the classic example is, of course, refer to paragraph, in this case, two, refer to paragraph seven, whatever it is. But you must then refer to only that paragraph. Number five, identify the instruction word or words in the questions. Highlight or underline them. That is to ensure that you know exactly what is being asked. Number six, true, false, agree, disagree. It's strange but true that often people change this to yes or no. Please avoid doing that. If it's true or false, you must answer either true or false. And please answer correctly. Then, carrying on with our Tips on answering comprehension tests. Let me just line this up so that you can all see it. Good. True, false, etc. The marks are for the justification, not the true or false component. And in this particular paper, it says substantiate. It doesn't say uh, justify, but the words are essentially synonyms. They have the same meaning. Number eight. When you are asked to quote from the text, ensure that the quote is the correct length. They have given you some examples, sentence, clause, phrase, three consecutive words, which is very common, etc. And use quotation marks. Now, a question that came up in a previous um, presentation. Will you lose marks if you do not use quotation marks? And the answer is, at the moment, no. But I cannot guarantee 
that that will stay like that for the rest of the year, whatever. Please get into the habit of using quotation marks when you are quoting. Number nine, a very common fault that I continually see when I'm marking these papers is always answer by referring to the text. Never use your own knowledge. Dangerous. You can answer a question correctly, but because the answer is not taken from the text, it will be wrong anyway. Number 10, a question which is often asked is to provide a suitable title for the text. In this case, it doesn't apply, but just ensure that it is relevant and the correct length. Number 11, this one does apply. As far as possible, avoid copying answers directly from the text unless a quote is required, of course. And in this paper, it was specified that your answers could only be in your own words unless they were one-word answers. And then, finally, leave a line open between your answers. That is, of course, to make life easier for the poor person who is marking this. Let me move that out of the way. And now, let us take a look at the first of the texts. And for simplicity's sake, I've, of course, enlarged these in order to make it easier to see on your screens. There we go. Let's read through this text together now, so that before we review the questions and answers, the text is once again fresh in your minds. Now, it's called The Science of Satisfaction. It talks about genetics plus circumstances plus open brackets, state of mind, close brackets, squared, equals satisfaction. Now, that alone... I could base many questions on that. Oh, it's a wonderful way to state it. It shows the importance of the state of your mind. So before you even read the text, there you've got a very good idea about the message that is in this text. Then it says, it's by Tony, young husband. And it goes on to say, quit the blame game. It's not your genes, your income, your job or your partner. Your happiness, say the experts, depends largely on on you. This is true, by the way. You know, uh, many of you out there are, like me, uh, practicing Christians, and of course you sing that song in the church, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, it's from Psalm 117, just, uh, sorry, Psalm 118, for interest's sake. But how many of you apply it? I do, I try to. So, now, having said that, let's go back to our text. Globally, antidepressants, alcohol, divorce, plastic surgery, bigger homes, faster cars, diets, motivational books, and seminars are popular items on the shopping list for the one thing that everybody wants, happiness. Yet, levels of depression and suicide rates, stress and anxiety are at record highs. So why are these so-called panaceas not working? For a start, psychologists say, we are looking in the wrong places. While material wealth and security can act as stabilizers and medication is essential in the case of clinical depression, satisfaction cannot be acquired and sustained if you expect it to come from outside yourself. There are three key elements for happiness or what psychologists call subjective well-being. Karen Milner Associate Psychology Professor at Wits University. Genetics account for 20 to 40% of variations in SWB. Circumstances, that's gender, race, education level, income level, physical appearance, health status, geographical circumstances, and work conditions account for about 10%. And the rest comes from, and I'm just going 